Hello, and welcome to the uh, lightning round session that's going to focus on open educational resources. More specifically, I'm going to be talking today about reimagining the EPP pedagogy experience with the use of OERs. Before I get started, I wanted to first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Paul Hopkins. I'm an assistant professor at Capital University School of Education. Prior to my time at Capital University, I was an assistant superintendent, director of special education, principal, and most importantly, a social studies teacher. And again, our session today is reimagining the EPP pedagogy experience with the use of OERs. Now, I know anyone in education knows that we are a fan of acronyms, both using them and creating them. So before we get too far in, I wanted to make sure I explain EPPs are simply university-based programs that help prepare teacher candidates for the profession of education. OERs are known as Open Educational Resources. These are often materials that we use for teaching or learning that have been released in the public domain. Quite often they're characterized by the five R's, meaning that they can be reused, retained, redistributed, revised, and certainly remixed. Now, when we talk about reasons to include OERs and in pedagogy courses for teacher candidates, there's usually one um, immediate response. And this is usually why students love it when their professor um, introduces OERs instead of the required textbooks. And that is because OERs are generally free. Now, of course, this is not a surprise to anyone. Open educational resources mean just that. But it's more than just being free for students. Um, I want you to think about using OERs as not just reducing the cost, but certainly increasing the accessibility and opportunity. What we hear at many universities is that the cost of textbooks alone is a reason why students don't attend college in the first place. So by promising or trying to use OERs whenever possible, we certainly not only reduce the cost, but we certainly, in some cases, open the door for admission. What I'd like to do is not only say, yes, it's great because it's free, it lowers the cost, but also other reasons to dare to introduce OERs in pedagogy courses. Um, there is um, it increases the diversity of classes. When you have OERs, you're not relying on one person's or a couple of people's perspectives about the content. You're increasing the diversity of opinions. And in this day and age, and certainly valuable to ensure that our students have opportunities to get perspectives from all disciplines, from all different individuals. When I teach pedagogy for social studies teaching candidates, for example, it's really critical that I am allowing um, them access to opportunities to hear, listen, and read from a variety of authors in the area. Secondly, it's more accessible. When I think of students with disabilities, I sometimes think about um, students who possibly have visual or hearing impairments. OERs are more likely to offer opportunities to immediately increase the font or um, text-to-speech functionality. So OERs certainly do open it to more accessibility for all of our students. More relevant, what I mean by this is timely. Um, it's in social studies and history, a lot of times our textbooks are dated as soon as they're published. When we use OERs in our classroom, we're able to get current contemporary perspectives on events that are happening right now. So they're more relevant to our educators as well as to our learners. And lastly, I'd, I dare to say that they're more effective. OERs are just um, usually more engaging to the students in my pedagogy classes. So for these reasons, I would like to encourage you to consider OERs in your pedagogy classroom. So now that I've convinced you, hopefully, that OERs do have a place in the higher ed classroom, especially for future educators, the most often question is, all right, where do I find them? Like most of our students, when I started this, I simply Googled. And what I did is I found that there are quite a few OERs out there. Then I had to find out that there are some that are better than others. I collaborated with our uh, campus librarian, and he and I spent a lot of time kind of um, creating a list and trying to find which accesses, which Opportunities out there are both accessible to all students, not hidden behind any firewalls, for example, but also relevant and trustworthy. 
What I found is I'm just going to share a couple of these with you is in Indiana University of Pennsylvania was a great launching place for me. What they do is they have um, kind of put together a repository of many different um, resources for all different content areas. And this was the first place I started. And of course, it had links to others. And so I followed that down various rabbit holes. I also found OER Commons. This was um, a more organized um, platform that included um, areas for you to really kind of specialize your search a little bit further. It could identify, for example, what are you looking for? What subject areas? What educational levels? Um, and maybe what standards did you want to find? So again, just a couple of different um, sources. And I have some of the links to these two um, sites um, at the bottom of this slide for you to possibly use to begin your quest to find the most meaningful OERs for your particular subject areas. Once I started with OERs, I decided I wanted to take another step. And again, I think introducing OERs is what I did my first semester. And I simply you know, got a lot of uh, accolades, especially from students, that there no longer was a required textbook for them to purchase. But I wanted to move a little bit beyond that because it's one thing for our students to be consumers of information. What I wanted to um, progress to was the idea of having them be um, contributors to this existing library of resources. So what I wanted to do is I found as I kept digging for better OERs was a new area called Open Educational Practices or OEPs to add another acronym to your um, library. And what I found was that this process of simply just not providing them with free resources that we would use, read, evaluate, and add to our knowledge base was now challenging them to author and create some additional open educational practices that could contribute to the scholarly knowledge. What I did is I found an article, and I've got the citation at the bottom of this slide, that really opened my eyes to how I can move OERs to the next level. And this is what the authors called transformative practices. I believe they had about five, and so starting small, what I did is I started with three of them. And I really found that these um, practices really did open the pedagogical experience for our students. And it was really easy for me because I'm working with future educators and I wanted to hopefully challenge them to make their classrooms as open and engaging as possible for the students that are sitting in front of them. And so the first thing I did was, um, based on this article, was to look at how I build my course policies, how I look at the outcomes, various assignments and the rubrics, and also the schedule. When are things going to be due? And so the first class, instead of simply handing them a rubric, uh, or excuse me, in a syllabus, what I did is I handed them a draft syllabus. And together we looked at it and we decided what are some of the topics that are most meaningful and needed for them. And so they had a hand in helping create what the syllabus was going to look like for them for that semester. We also looked at dates. Now, I tried to make it as democratic as possible, but of course, there were some deadlines that I couldn't push too far. But the idea of allowing them some voice and input on when things were going to be due, especially based on other syllabi that they have just recently received from other professors, really made them feel that they were not just a passive participant in my class, but an active contributor. This was one transformative practice that immediately paid dividends and really helped improve the uh, culture of our classroom. And I say our classroom because it wasn't simply my classroom. Second, the thing I wanted to do was I wanted to share with them OERs, but then I started to invite them to revise OERs. This was a good kind of gradual step to them authoring their own. What I did was I shared with them some resources. For example, there were many videos and open textbook chapters that I shared with them that they got to select from. Then what I wanted them to do on some of these OERs, it invites people to contribute, to revise, to um, you know, improve the quality of the work. And so what I challenged them to do was to first select a particular OER and then go in there and present edits to this OER so that they felt, okay, I've kind of given the idea of how this works and how they can be contributors to the process. 
Thirdly, as you might guess, I had them author original OERs. This, in many cases, replaced my final in the pedagogy class. Instead of simply having them you know, recall information, what I wanted to them is to push them to higher levels of web's depth of knowledge and to become true designers of lessons and designers of original work. And so what I had them do is select and oftentimes work in pairs to collaboratively develop, design, and write original pieces of work. This, in a couple of cases, has led them to also present at some local, state, and even some national conferences where they are now taking their work and sharing it with um, other um, undergraduate students, but often some professors and leaders in the field. And it really has transformed um, our class. And it has really made them hopefully better teachers because now they've got some experience in presenting and sharing novel ideas about social studies, history, government, uh, political science, and the like. And so it's really changed and it's really changed the perception of this class is simply, hey, I'm here to learn to the idea of I'm here to learn and contribute. And this has really transformed our classroom from, like I said, that passive in environment to a more collaborative learning space along the way. Again, this did not happen overnight. It's been a few semesters and every semester I challenge each new group a little bit more because they're now revising some work that maybe a student in the semester before them actually created. So again, start small in order to go far as that proverb uh, says. I would certainly like to, first of all, thank you for listening and joining me in this conversation. And I'd love to make this conversation a two-way conversation moving forward. If this is something that you have done in your pedagogy class or something that you're thinking about doing and would love to connect, um, my email address is listed um, on this slide, phopkins, the number five, at capital.edu. I would love to learn more from you and also see how we can push our collective students to um, better steps moving forward. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a great conference.